<clears throat> so do me a favor and grab a Bible, please, and open it to Ephesians chapter 4. I'm just going to continue on where we were in our study. Please put a copy of God's Word in your hand. Don't just listen to me. Everything we talk about here is got to be from the Bible all the time. <clears throat> Let me ask you a question. Have you ever uh, started something or got into a situation, something new, and the results of it uh, didn't really meet your expectations of it? Anybody? Like, um, you plan all year for a, for a vacation, and, 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 you know, I've heard about this place, and it's so beautiful, and my buddy went, and the pictures were incredible, and you got to go, and, and so you make the plans, and you go, and you get there, and it's like, eh, you know, not so awesome. You start a new job, right? Well, this is going to be the job where I'm going to be happy, and this is the job that's going to make me the living that I need, and... And this is the career that I've been working my whole life for. This is it right here. And then you get there, and your boss is just as much of a jerk as your boss was at McDonald's when you're making eight bucks an hour. It, it, it doesn't make any difference to where the job is, right? There's always going to be something. But maybe it's, this is a big one, right? Everyone's going to probably say yes to this. Uh, a new boyfriend or girlfriend. Man, is she hot. He is so handsome. And then he speaks. And it's over. Right? And then if you're really stupid, you marry him. Because marriage is going to be amazing. Right? It's going to be incredible. And everyone has these expectations. We've got a newly... A little newlywed action going on over here. If you look on Facebook, everything's perfect. <laughs> Is it perfect? Well, you lie to me in church. Most of there we go. Good disclaimer. They're still holding hands. What's right? What's wrong with the rest of you married people? There they go. <laughs> well, marriage is gonna. It's gonna. I have expectations for marriage too. You know, I was. Um, I was. Uh, fortunate to, to be a part of a, of a uh, there's a marriage series going on at Frontier Church a couple weeks ago, you know, Pastor Steve, my buddy, so he did a marriage thing and he had a, a panel, one week he had husbands and the next week he had wives and he asked Meredith and I to go and be a part of that, which is pretty funny, guy who's been married four times, you're going to have them on your marriage, <laughs> but I figured that, you know, if the guy who wrote the most about marriage in the Bible was single, then maybe I got a shot, right? <clears throat> but I learned a lot, but I'll tell you one thing that's crazy about marriage. <clears throat> you ever watch the movie Jeremy Maguire? Yes. You've seen that movie. Is that the one when they say, you complete me? That is such a load of crap. <laughs> Seriously. We have expectations when we get into the marriage that she or he is going to make me complete. Let me just give you a little advice from the guy who's been down the road and the road and the road and the road. If you think that's the way it works, you're sadly mistaken. That the marriage is not that she completes you. The marriage is how can you complete that. And if you don't get that thing right, you're destined for failure. You've got to change your expectations. <clears throat> how about a new neighborhood? You move to a new neighborhood, a new house, right? I'm going to be happy now. This is exactly what I wanted. So the only problem with that is that that's geography, and you brought the problem with you, and it's called you. <clears throat> okay, so expectations are high until you move into the guy next door who's barbecuing drunk and naked. You know what I'm saying. It's just... One time. There was one <laughs> <laughs> go to YouTube and you know I'm just kidding. Here's another one, you ready? Parents, 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 right? Parenthood. That's going to make me happy. Let's have some kids. Who even had that idea? 
I wanted to be selfish my whole life and, and, and just ride a motorcycle and have no children. So God gave me six. So much for your expectations, right? Right out the window. How about your expectations for a church? It's the same kind of a thing. You go into a new church. You came out of another church, maybe, and it failed you. Didn't like the way you wanted it to work. You came into a new church. You really liked the flooring. <clears throat> you thought the music was good. You liked the preacher. He was funny. Coffee was good. They served Starbucks. So I have expectations for my church. You know, hang out for a little while. And, and it, maybe it doesn't work out the way you thought it would. And so, you know, from where I am as a pastor, I've seen a lot of people come and go. Because their expectations were here and, and we couldn't meet them. And so they leave. That's common, right? <clears throat> but the real question I have for you is, is when it comes to expectations, what about your Christianity? I mean, you made a decision to be a Christian. There was one day you said yes, and you made a decision to be a Christian, and, and along with that, you had expectations as to how it was going to work out for you. All of us do. And, and maybe it's because you met someone who was a Christian, and they seemed to have it going on. Every, they were smiling 24-7. They, they were rich. They had a, a smoking wife. They had a hot husband. Great career. Everyone's happy. Everything's good. Beautiful home. Their parent, the parent, they never fight. I mean, and so you have expectations about your Christianity too. And so I want you to think about that. Is your Christianity, is it rewarding as you thought it would be? Is there a, you know, the Bible says in the presence of God there is fullness of joy. Are you experiencing that? How about your relationship with him and with other people? Especially within your own body. I shared with the church last week, I share again, I love looking on Facebook and seeing like you guys go out with another couple that you didn't know before until you came here and now you're friends. Like that, that blesses me and I know it blesses the Lord too. And, and you have that. I mean, is your relationship at the church, is it, is it good or is it just, eh? Do you feel safe in your community of faith and love? I guess the bottom line is this, is, is Jesus said in John 10, 10, that he came that you might have a life abundantly. Are you living an abundant life? Would you say that your life is totally different now than it was before Christ, BC? Yeah, you know, ask yourself the question, like, don't just let me yell it at you, like, ask yourself the question, think for a moment. Is it all it's cracked up to be? Has it changed? Is it better? Do you feel the fullness of joy? Do you feel? Can we, you know what? Can, we, can, you, can you do me a favor? Can, uh, Tim, can you go back and turn some of those lights on back there? I want to be able to see your pretty faces. <laughs> More often than not, in my experience anyway, I think church folks fall into two categories. I think they, they fall into two categories that, and they're not experiencing the abundant life that they should. I think it's two categories. I think there's the waiting on the Lord people, and then there's the trying real hard people. And, and neither one of those techniques really will reap a harvest that is plentiful. I, I don't think, is it hot in here? Is it? Hmm. First time. You want to turn the AC down too, Tim? Would that be okay? <laughs> so, it's, you know, it's the first week. It's the first week. We'll work on that. So I came in and I turned it down to 72 about two hours ago. So it's a process. I'll learn. I'm trying to save money. I don't want to do it all day because then it's you know through the roof. So I'll try two hours earlier. I'll, I'll try two hours earlier next week. See if we get it. Uh, but anyway, the, either one of these two methods will really uh, not reap a harvest of godliness. It will not have you enjoying this abundant life that, that God wants for you. And I don't. And I think as we look in the scripture, you're going to see that. Let's talk a little bit about the waiting on the Lord people, okay? Here's their, here's their theme verses. I jotted a couple of them down. You can 
You can jot these down if you like. These are the ones that they love. Um, Psalm 46.10, be still and know I'm God. That's a good one, right? That's a good one. Gotta be still. Wait on the Lord. Isaiah 40, 31. This is a, this is a famous one because it was in a song with a little kid at the end. But those who wait upon the Lord will find new strength. <laughs> They'll soar on wings like eagles and run and not grow weary. You know that one, right? You heard that song. Uh, Psalm 40, verse 1. I waited patiently for the Lord. And he helped me. And he turned and he heard my cry. So I'm just going to wait. I'm going to wait on the Lord. <clears throat> when are you going to quit drinking? When are you going to quit smoking? When are you going to keep cussing? When are you going to stop cussing? When are you going to stop doing these things that you know you're supposed to stop? I'm just waiting on the Lord. What are you waiting on? He already said not to do it. I'm just waiting on the Lord. <clears throat> A lot of people do that. Just wait and wait and wait. And days and weeks and months. And too often years and decades go by. And there's just no change in their life. And they know I shouldn't do this anymore. But I'm waiting on the Lord. I have news for you. The power that raised Christ from the dead lives in you now if you're a believer. You don't need to wait anymore. If you know there's something you should or shouldn't do, the time is now to make a choice not to do it anymore. That's it. Okay? That's it. But unfortunately, people are waiting and waiting and waiting, and you see no, no, no uh, change. There's no burning desire to devour God's word. There's no increase in their generosity. Their church experience is still eh. not too many close relationships. The prayers just hit the ceiling and don't seem to get anywhere. Anybody? Jesus really hasn't fixed my marriage yet. I'm waiting on the Lord. Because the one who began a good work is going to continue to do so until the day of Christ Jesus, right? <clears throat> so I just sit and I wait. And I wait for him to do something. And I wait. And I wait. <laughs> when are you going to do something, Lord? <clears throat> I think those people drive me the most crazy. And I love them. I don't think that they realize that the power to make the change is right now. You don't need to wait anymore. But that's one group of people. The other group is the, and this is pretty self-explanatory, these are the try-hard people. I'm going to quit drinking, I'm going to quit smoking, I'm going to quit lady chasing, I'm going to quit cussing. I'm going to try to, try, try, I'm going to try to get to church. I'm going to try, try to get to church. And I got this, uh, I don't understand any of it, but I get this with this Bible reading plan. I'm gonna knock this sucker out in the end of here. I have no idea what it says, but I'm gonna read it in the end. I'm gonna try, <clears throat> but the problem is this is exhausting and fruitless. You know, atheists, a stone cold atheist who does not even believe that God exists can be a nice guy who doesn't drink, smoke, cuss. A lady chase. But they ain't Christ-like. They're just nice guys. There's a difference. <clears throat> but both categories are wrong. The waiting on, the, on God people, they do nothing and they get nothing. The try-hard people do a lot, but they get nowhere except tired and frustrated. <clears throat> but I think Ephesians chapter 4 and 5, although it's labeled by the uh, publishers as uh, unity in the body and living in the light. I think those are, are good titles, but I don't think that they are uh, as good as they could be. I think Ephesians 4 and 5 paints a very clear picture of what God's holy people do. Of what a faithful follower of Christ does. Not what a faithful follower of Christ ought to do. No, a faithful follower of Christ does this. What I'm about to share with you. Okay, what I'm about to share with you. Let's start in verse... 17 of chapter 4. You guys there? Alright. 
So Paul says, with the Lord's authority, I say this. Pause. You know, the Bible says that all Scripture is, is, is God-breathed. That, that every law and all the prophets was in, these were not the movement of men, but these were, this was the movement of the Spirit of God speaking through people. All of the Bible, all of this, from cover to cover, was written by God. You've got to understand this, okay? But Paul, he's like, and he's the one who even said that all Scripture is God's read. But even, but even though he's the guy who wrote that, he even says right here, with the Lord's authority. Like, he's really pressing in here. Like, listen up. This is, this is like Jesus Christ standing before you, talking to you. With the Lord's authority, I say this. Live no longer as the Gentiles do. Now the Gentiles is just euphemistic for those who are, are not believers. These are not God's people. Okay? So there's a difference between someone who's God's uh, person and someone who's not God's person. There's a distinct difference in the way they think, the way they act, the way they conduct themselves, their worldview, their perspectives. Everything is different. And he says, with the Lord's authority. So this is like Jesus saying directly to you, don't live like that anymore. Stop. Live no longer as the Gentiles do. And then he tells us what they are. And I hope this isn't you. For they are hopelessly confused. He goes on, he says, their minds are full of darkness. They wander far from the life God gave because they have closed their minds and hardened their hearts against him. They have no sense of shame. They live for lustful pleasure and eagerly practice every kind of impurity. I don't know about you, but I'm just thinking that's the 6 o'clock news right there, dude. Right? That, that's, the country, that's the air we breathe right there, right? That's the country we live in. The world is, it, it, this is outlined in, in one paragraph, God hit it right on the head. This is how we live. But he says, he says, with the Lord's authority, don't live as the Gentiles do. They are hopelessly confused. And see, as the church, we're, we're, we, we look at people that act a certain way, and they, they, they're kind of naughty, and we bark at them and tell them how rotten they are. And, and, he's, and he's, he's not saying they're, that they're rotten, terrible people. He's saying they're confused. They're just, have you ever been confused about something? I mean, I, I went to school. I took algebra. I was confused. Anyone in this room like algebra? Yeah. You need to find a new church, dude. That is crazy. <laughs> You're insane, dude. He did find a new church. He started one. We love algebra there. That's why I can't go. He speaks in logarithms. I don't know. He's going to tone it down to the King James now. Hey, Kelly started a church. It's called The Table. It's at Tiberi's Sunday mornings at 10. Right? 10.30. So if you want to go, go to it. And I'll show you where it is. I'll tell you where it is. I can't show you where it is. That would be kind of rough. That would be awesome. So, um, they're confused. They're just confused. It says there in verse 18 that they were, they had, a, they had the reason why is because they have a closed mind and a hard heart. And, and so it's not that they're like, they're not jerks, they're not ignorant, they're, they're not stupid, they're not they're not bad, they're just, they're, they're confused. They, they hear, they'll hear, especially, okay, listen, we're, we're in America, where 70% of us claim to be Christians. And we're in the South, where 90% of us claim to be Christians. Like, it's, 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 it's hip to be a Christian here. It's, it's common to be a Christian here. But you go to other places in this country, it's not so common, you're, you're sort of an outcast. But here, it's common to be a Christian. Very, very common. So, so people hear about Jesus. They hear about the Bible, but they're confused because they also let other things and other ways and other, other worldviews and perspectives and religions, and it, they let it all in, and, and it's confusing to people because, you know, Jesus says, I'm the, way, I'm the way and the truth and the life, and no one gets to the Father except through me. And, but then these other religions come around, they sound good, 
They, they tell you what you want to hear. They tickle your ears. They comfort you. They make you feel better. And you're like, well, I love the whole Jesus thing because he was nice and he healed people and he fed people and he was kind and he took sin and all that stuff. But I don't really like the fact that I have to give 10% of my income and I don't like the fact that I have to drink the blood and eat the flesh. Like, what the heck is that, right? I just need a little zen or something or chi. I just need a little inner peace. So, so we have all these different things that we kind of, and so what we do is we build this hybrid Christianity of our own. And every one of us has our own little brand of Christianity that we build. And really there's only one brand of biblical, it's biblical Christianity. It's that thing that you have in your hand. That's Christianity and that alone. That was a great amen to just in case you were looking for one tonight. So they hear it, but it's confusing because there's all these different conflicting experts out there. Or, or, or here's one too that, that you can put in the category of closed mind and hard heart. They, they say, well, I, I, like, I like this, I like the Bible, and I love this, this grace thing over here because, you know, I'm kind of naughty, and, and I need a little grace. And so Jesus is the grace God. But this Old Testament stuff, man, I can't, I can't do that wrath thing. I can't do the, the, the fact that God can actually get a little frustrated with me and he can actually get a little angry at times. Like I can't, I can't do that part. I can't do the part about I, that he came, no, he came maybe to, to, to serve and not to be served, but that's not me, I'm the CEO, man. And so we have a hard time with some of the Bible. And so we say, I love this part, and I love this part, but, you know, we live in a different day now. We live in a different culture now, right? And that, that might have been good back then, but it's a different world now. Let me tell you something. These are timeless truths. And all the rest of this stuff is just shifting circumstances. But this applies all the time. It never gets old. The Holy Spirit leads us to all truth. And there's no need for any supplemental ideologies that kind of infringe upon the truth of God's Word. We don't need any other teachers as well to achieve godliness. We only need God and His Word, and that's it. So a closed mind and a hard heart doesn't always mean just talk to the hand, like, I'm not listening. Sometimes it's just, I, I, I've, heard, I've heard you, preacher, and I kind of get it, and I kind of like it, but I've, I've decided that this is what I'm going to do, and, and, and nothing's going to infringe upon that. I've, I like Ephesians, and I like uh, 1 John, and I like, uh, like Revelation. Revelation's awesome, man. Dragons and stuff, that's cool. Okay, but, but, but this whole, this Adam and Eve thing, that, that's crazy. No, there's no boat. Come on, man, there's no boat. They haven't found a boat. Show me the boat, man, and then I'll believe in you, Jesus. Show me your transitional fossil. Never mind. <laughs> so, <clears throat> this is how we're going to do it. And I've made up my mind, maybe that's what it means to have a closed mind and a hard heart. You know, the Bible is adamant time and time again. I think it's in Deuteronomy and then over again in Hebrews 3.7. It says, today, if you hear his voice, don't harden your heart. If you hear something coming out of my mouth today as I'm quoting the Bible to you, if you hear it and it's, and it's for you, don't, 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 talk, don't tell God to talk to the hand. Listen. Listen. Let it soak in. Let it change you. Let it help you. Right? It says in Revelation chapters 2 and 3, seven times, seven times. What does that mean? He just really wants to get the point across, right? Anyone with ears to hear should listen to what the Spirit is saying and understand it. Like, it's God's adamant. When I speak, you need to pay attention. It's important, and you need this. And you need it. To me, that sounds like waiting on the Lord, which I have a hard time with. But that's what God's telling us. But let me tell you what God is really telling us. <laughs> Chapter 4, verse 22 through 24, look what it says. <clears throat> Th 
throw off your old sinful nature and your former way of life, which is corrupted by lust and deception. Instead, let the Spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes and put on your new nature, created to be like God, truly righteous and holy. So, this is really what he wants us to do. It's not about waiting on the Lord and doing nothing. It's not about just like a, 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 a hamster in a wheel, trying, trying, trying to get better, trying to get better, behavior modification. I'm going to be, I'm going to swear less, I'm going to drink less, I'm going to smoke less, I'm going to be better, I'm going to go to church on occasion, I'm going to put my buck in the box, like I, I'm going to do those things. That's not it either. Here's the recipe for success. Here's the recipe for holiness right here. Throw off your old nature. I wish I, I should have brought a prop. I should have brought a jacket. But you can, can you see me doing it? Taking it off and just chucking it off of them, right? right. Now, and, and it's not, um, <clears throat> okay, I'm going to step on some toes and don't take it personal, okay? Just get over it. So let's say you're a smoker, right? Because I was a smoker and I tried this. I tried like slowing down, right? I tried to, 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 to smoke less. And that's not what he's saying here. He's saying take the pack out of your, out of your pocket and throw it away. Now, like he's not saying like, you know, maybe just try to cuss a little bit less. You know, just don't, don't use the F-bomb, but maybe A's and S's are okay. <laughs> no, he's like, throw off your old nature. Like, get rid of it. Chuck it. Be done with that. Like, make a decision today that I'm no longer that guy or that girl. I, whatever it is that's holding me back, throw it off. Chuck it into the ocean. Like, it's gone forever. Don't do it anymore. It's that easy. That's not arrogance. That's living proof. One day, I drank like a fish, and I smoked like a chimney. And in one day, I said, God, no more. Help me not do it anymore. And I haven't had a cigarette or a drink in like 14 years. I, I, I just, and I'm, no, I'm just a guy, I'm definitely flesh and blood. <laughs> like everybody here. Like if you want to do, if you know, if you've read this book and you feel like God has spoken to you about something, the power to do it is, is, is available now and it should be done today. That, that, throw off the old nature. Be done with it. But then the, there's the next step. See, that's just step one. See, we get rid of the old stuff, right? Then he says, he doesn't just say, now go, now, now, now go be different. <laughs> You got rid of this, now don't do this. It's not that easy, really. He says, throw off your old nature, which is corrupted by lust and deception. Instead, let the Spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes. See, it's not just throw off the old nature, now I'm gonna go be a new person right now. Go, 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 go. No, that's death, that's failure. Every time, off the cliff. <clears throat> There's a process. You throw it off and then you sit at the feet of Jesus. And you learn. And you make yourself available. And, and you know, I, I quote the scripture all the time, Romans 12, 2. Don't copy the behaviors and customs of this world. It's going to sound exactly like this. Throw off the old nature. Instead, let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. What does that let mean? Here I am, Lord. I'm available. Access to my heart, access to my head. I'm at your feet. I'm in your word frequently and consistently. I'm praying. I'm in fellowship. I'm serving you. I'm in, Lord. Have at me. Change me. Fix me. Heal me. Cure me. Save me. Right? That's what we have to do. That's, that's letting the Spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes. It's to change your mind and it has to change your heart. And that's what he says right here. Before you go out head over heels trying to conquer the world for Jesus, you've got to spend a little time with him. You have to. Okay, so now I've thrown off my old nature. I'm not like that anymore, right? I'm different. I've spent time with Jesus. I'm in his word consistently. Someone say amen. amen. Even the people who don't. That's cool. Say amen anyway. Maybe that'll be what you need to get started today. <laughs> That's what this message is about today. 
We don't know if tomorrow's coming, right? So today, read your Bible. Spend time with the Lord. Let Him change the way you think. And the way you think is jacked up. The way I feel is jacked up. So I need to change. So the Lord changed me. So now I've got some new stuff in me, right? I'm, I'm, he's renewing, it says. Renew your thoughts. Right? So I've got something new inside of me now. And the next step is, now that you've got something new, and you're out here kind of naked, if you will, I'm, 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 I've ripped off my robe, I'm naked, I'm open, Lord, change me, put some new stuff in me. Now, he says, now put on the new nature and go. And go change. Go be different. Go be different. Put on the new. Put on the new nature, created to be like God, truly righteous and holy. And see, it's not just sitting around doing nothing, and it's not just running around doing everything, but it's both. You see, the, the, the picture that the scriptures paint is not waiting on the Lord to do nothing and running around trying. It's, it's, it's take off the old, get something new, and then go. And it's both things. It's this, I don't know about you guys, but I see this relationship with God that's He's just in step with me, right? He's in step with you, like working together, like a team, working in unison. Like, did you ever see those just awful uh, synchronized swimmers in the pool that Saturday Night Live made fun of? It's, but that's kind of what it is, right? Figure skating, the, the couples, when they do it together, how they just... They just work perfectly together. Dancing with the Stars. Okay, maybe you've seen that. You're all like, look at me like that. I've never seen the Olympics. What are you talking about, Moses? The Olympics? Okay, Dancing with the Stars. You see that, right? So you see how they work together. The dancers move together. Fluid, perfect. One person's leading, the other one's following. Perfect step by step together. And that's exactly what's happening here between you and the Lord. It's this perfect relationship. God's teaching He's empowering you, and then you respond to that, and you do as you are told. And let me tell you something, to circumvent this system, rest assured, you will surely circumvent your success. There's no, there's no, you cannot mock the justice of God, what you sow, you will reap, it's proven fact. If you don't do this, this abundant joy, this abundant life, this this peace that surpasses all understanding, the deep relationship with God and His people, all that, you won't get it. It's not available to you. If you just try real hard, you got to do it this way. He says, stop doing life the old way. I like, I like what he says here. It's, he says, uh, which is corrupt. <clears throat> we all have computers, right? Do you ever try to download something and play it or read it? And you just can't because it says you got a corrupt file. Did you ever see that screen? I had the screen saved. I had a picture I was going to put up. We have a sticking projector. Yet. <clears throat> but but the, the problem with, with the corrupt file is that no matter what type of program you try to use to open it, it won't. It doesn't matter how much of a genius you are with computers trying to figure out how to open a file. If it's corrupt, the file's trashed. And no amount of putting something to it to try to make it work will make it open. It's ruined already from the inside out. There's no helping it. And so we try to change things in our life by adding this system and this program and this approach and this resolution and this effort. The, look, it says here that you're like... Inside, you're corrupt. So it doesn't make any difference what you try to attach to it to try to make it better. The problem's in here. You have a, your life is corrupt. It's been corrupted. It can't be fixed no matter what the program. But the thing that's awesome about God is that He can actually fix the corrupt file. He doesn't throw a new program at you. He renews your thoughts and attitudes. He works on the inside, changing the corrupt file so that it can be opened. Let the Spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes. And then, of course, in verse 24, he says, Now, now that I've fixed your, this corrupt file, now go live it out. God does his part. You do your part. It's not 
all or none, it's both. We stop, we give God access, and then we do. Renew. The waiting on the Lord verses <clears throat> that I gave you, if you notice, they're all Old Testament. Did you notice that? Two in Psalms and one in Isaiah. And waiting on the Lord back then was way different than waiting on the Lord now. Like God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. But the world that you live in is a little bit different. And who you are is a little bit different. Actually, it's a lot of it different. Because the Holy Spirit that used to move amongst the people and, and, and communicate with them and, and pull people towards God and, and all that, He now lives in you. See, the Old Testament God, they didn't have that. So it wasn't some far off. He's not a far off God anymore, guys. He's right here, right now, in you. In you. And the Holy Spirit also inspired this amazing book. God's Word, inspired by the Holy Spirit. And you know what? Those Old Testament guys, they didn't have this full book. As time went on, they had the first five books. But the guys in the beginning, they didn't have any books. You got a full book, 66 books of perfect revelation, words. I think it's like 174,000 words from Almighty God right at your disposal, right here, right now. They didn't have that back then. So waiting on the Lord back then was literally sitting and I'm waiting on the Lord. And I would sit until he spoke. Now that can happen today too. But more times than not, it's not happening. Where it's happening is right here. Amen, Greg? It's happening right here. I think that's Jackson, isn't it? Mm -hmm. My daughter, Jackson. <laughs> so this brings us back to our original questions when I first started, which is, you know, do you ha are you living this abundant life? Are you experienced the, the fullness of joy? Is your church experience thriving and flourishing and you love the relationships and you can't wait to get here? And, and, and I wish we didn't just have Saturday and I wish we had Sundays and I wish I could go to these groups during the week and we should be doing this and we should be doing that together. And, and you know, is it, is, it, is, it, is it just make your spirit just jump when you think about your church experience or is it more of an obligation that you have to go to because your parents tell you you should? Is there a ton of change in me toward godliness? Is, is my Christianity basically all that it could be? And, and you really should ask the questions. And so if you're waiting on the Lord for Him to speak to you about any question in life, anyone have any questions for the Lord? If you have a question for the Lord, just raise your hand right now. Is there one that you have? Any of them? Anyone have any questions for the Lord? Okay. I'm not serving. Okay. The answer is already in the Word. Yes. So you don't need to wait anymore. You don't need to wait anymore. So it, listen, if you have questions and you're waiting on the Lord for an answer, I think a lot of them are going to get answered right here, right now. Okay? I think He's about to talk to you right now. But you need to, listen, you need to give Him access to your heart and access to your head. You have to be willing to, to, to lower yourself and say, Lord, if anything is right in me, it's because you made it that way and it has to line up with who you are. It, it, other than that, there's nothing right. So, so I'm, I'm opening myself to you and I, I just want you to change who I am. Right now, I'm, I'm, all of my preconceived notions of what Christianity are, uh, is or, or, or what people told me it should be or my parents or the old pastor or the, the, the preacher or the, the whatever, anybody that told me what I was supposed to be or any, any worldview that I had or any, any habit that I had or any, any waiting that I thought I needed to do, whatever it is, just anything. Lord, out the window. And, I, and right now, I just bow before you, and I'm asking you right now to just pour into me the answers I need. And I want to do it your way. And when you tell me, 
I'm not going to wait anymore. I'm going to receive that word right now. I'm going to tap into the power of the Spirit that raised Christ from the dead that lives in me. And I'm going to do it right here, right now. I'm throwing off the old and I'm putting on the new. Speak to me right now. So, I'm going to read. And you can close your eyes if you want, or you can read along with me. I'm going to read some. And maybe God will speak to you specifically in His Word right now. Stop telling lies. Verse 25. Stop telling lies. Let us tell our neighbors the truth for you're all parts of the same body. Stop telling lies. You know, my relationships at the church just really aren't that good. I can probably count on my, on a portion of one hand how many close friends I have and I have had for an extended period of time. Now, this isn't me talking. This is maybe you. Well, maybe you need to stop lying. Maybe you just need to tell people the truth of who you are and what you're up to. The Bible says certainly your sin's going to find you out, so it's not like you're going to get away with it. Maybe your relationships with people aren't really that deep and good and lasting because they can't believe a word out of your mouth. So maybe you don't need some amazing, you know, burning bush to appear right here on the stage or Jesus to come walking through the wall. Maybe you just need to quit lying. And don't let and don't sin by letting anger control you. It's okay to get mad. But when your anger dictates your next move, bomb. Wrong. You can't do that. So maybe your relationships at your church aren't thriving. Maybe your relationships at home or at work aren't thriving because you're a time bomb. Because one false look and you're screaming! And everyone has to tiptoe around you because they're, they're afraid to make you mad. How could you have a good relationship with anyone like that? Again, no Bernie Bush here. He says, uh, don't let the sun go down while you're still angry. Or anger gives a foothold to the devil. See, I don't even, I'm not quite sure if that really means, like, you know, the sun's going down, like, go make it right before the sun goes down. Or maybe it's just euphemistic for this. Stop holding on to your anger. Like, deal with it now. Today's message is about today, right? Yes. So, so maybe you need to deal with your anger. If, you gotta, if you're mad about something, like right now, deal with it now. Maybe, because you know what? I, I, I don't know, but I think maybe people get angry after the sun goes down. So I don't know that he really meant that. I don't know. I'm not God, and, 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 and Jesus didn't tell me. So I don't know if it's literally this or, you know. Deal with your anger now. Maybe you're not experiencing the fullness of joy in the presence of God because your face is as red as this chair because you're so mad about something. Maybe that's all it is. If you're a thief, quit stealing. I love Paul. He's pretty, he's pretty uh, straightforward and blunt, right? Mm -hmm. If you're a thief, quit stealing. Now, I don't know if there's anybody in this room that's, you know, out stealing cars. And you know, when I was a kid, I used to steal radar detectors out of cars. That was what we did. And I don't know if anybody's like in this room like a real like thief in that sense like going around stealing stuff that doesn't belong to you but um, do you ever steal some lustful looks at another man's wife she doesn't belong to you do you ever check out another wife another woman's husband from head to toe you just stole something that doesn't belong to you keep your eyes on your own woman and your own man you know like stuff like that you know what I mean Maybe you just uh, stealing stuff. Maybe you're you're an employee, and someone's paying you, and when they're not looking, you're on the phone 
texting your girlfriend or talking about where you're going drinking tonight or whatever, and that's stealing money from somebody, right? Yeah. Amen. So maybe, 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 you know what? I just, I don't know God as well as some of you do, and some of you have been a Christian longer than me, but I don't think that God blesses unfaithfulness. I see no evidence of that in the scriptures, and I just see no evidence of it in our lives. He never blesses unfaithfulness. He blesses those whose hearts are completely His, and that's what He's looking for. So quit stealing stuff. Instead, use your hands for good, hard work. That was a spot for you, Dan. Say amen. 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 <laughs> he doesn't work hard. That's why he has workers. <laughs> Talk about that later. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, um, use your hands for good hard work. Like, is there anyone in here who doesn't think that people should put in a good day of hard work? Right? I we should, right? Everybody? That's good, right? But see, that's not the end of the statement. Like, we all think you should work hard, right? But then it says, as a result of your working hard, you don't just go and spend it all on yourself and go, Whoa, look at me, I made all this money, and look at all the stuff I have as a result of it. It says, work hard and then give generously to others in need. You see, we're, a lot of us miss that part, right? We can't miss that part because we're looking for the abundant life. We're, we're looking for, for the, the joy in the presence of God. We're looking for deep relationships. We're looking for, for fulfillment in our church life. We're looking for fulfillment as a whole in our Christianity. Well, and this is part of it. And if you're not doing this and you're circumventing this system, you're circumventing your reward, right? No burning bush, just straight up God's word. I love God's word. Um, how about this next one, verse 29? Don't use foul or abusive language. Let everything you say be good and helpful so that your words will be an encouragement to those who hear them. I found something new in this world. <clears throat> um, you know, Christianity is definitely under attack in our country. You guys all know that. It's not like, that's not breaking news right there, was it? <clears throat> Transgender bathrooms. Ten years ago, you a dude walks into a girl's room, he gets beat up. I'm not saying that that's good. I'm just saying, look at look how far we've come in such a short time. I mean, we got we got we got men who think they're women on the cover of women's magazines, kind of jacked up. I mean, but 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 if you say anything about it, they say you hate them. I don't hate anybody. Unless you play for the Lakers. <laughs> it's basketball hate. It's totally different. You don't even know how to play. <clears throat> but here's what Christians have, have done in response to this political correct thing and all. A lot of us have gone completely the other way. We feel like we can say whatever we want, and if you don't like it, tough. If you don't like it, unfriend me. If you don't like it, don't look at my Facebook page. That's wrong. Now it says here, and a lot of us, here's another one too, I want to get to that. A lot of us have these different standards on what's a filthy word, what, you know. I know some people don't think F-bombs are bad. That's fine, that's your prerogative. You can say whatever you want, right? I'm not your daddy. <laughs> I can say to my house, if you don't like it, then don't listen to me. Listen. Don't use foul or abusive language. Well, it doesn't say what that foul or abusive language is. There's no list of cusses, does it? It doesn't. But what it does say is this. Let everything you say be good and helpful so that your words will be an encouragement to those who hear them. Do you see where the stress is? To those who hear them. We're Christians. We're supposed to think others is more important than ourselves. So if your, your condescending, demeaning bark offends and hurts other people, 
Wrong! 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 You can have your opinion too. But don't jam your opinion down someone's throat and insist that they need to believe it or don't listen to you. That's exactly what they're telling you to do and you don't like it, so you're fighting back the same way. It says here, let everything you say be good and helpful to the person who's hearing it. Be considerate of their feelings. You will never win someone to Christ by going on Facebook and telling them that they suck and if you don't like it, stay off my friggin' page. Never gonna happen. And, and does it happen all the time? Universal, right? It's all over the place. It's the sweetness of God that leads people to repentance. Not the verbal assault. So just because you think that it's okay to say it, that doesn't make it right. Because the person that's hearing it should take precedent over the person who is speaking it. No burning bush. Do not bring sorrow to God's Holy Spirit by the way you live. Just kind of threw that in there. Maybe that if you don't do this stuff that we're talking about, it grieves the Holy Spirit of God. Remember, he has identified you, or he's put a seal upon you, like the king with the wax and his ring. You're mine. And so you should act differently. He's guaranteed you'll be saved in the day of redemption. Now here's some more. Get rid of all bitterness. I don't see that as a suggestion. If you're in this room right now and you're angry at someone, there's, there's, there's something that you've got here. The power to, to let it go, it, 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 it resides in you right now. And you can choose right now, you can make a quality choice to, to release that person from the prison or from the prison you hold them in. Right now. And they might, that person could be dead. And they will never know of your decision to let them go. But you will. And you can start to enjoy the presence of God. Because if he shows up right here, and you're ripping mad and, let's say, pissed at everything, how can you enjoy him? Right? If I'm so mad right now at something, and, 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 the great, and someone drives in with a brand new Lamborghini, here, Moses, have it, and I'm just so mad! How would I enjoy this? Right? Oh. Is that my kid? That's my kid. I love you! I'm not mad at you! Get rid of all bitterness. Ooh, and rage. And anger. <laughs> you couldn't stage this stuff, man. This is <laughs> God is good. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, and slander, as well as all types of. See, he's talking. He's as all types of of evil behavior. See. What do we, what, what, give me some evil behavior, like real the bad ones, give me some. Murder, right? Rape, molesting people. What, give me some more, what are some other ones, right? Kill. The, the bad ones, what's that? Kill. Kill. Those are, that's evil, right? But what does God say about bitterness and anger? <coughs> Slander. The stuff we just, that's the air we breathe. We do it like it's nothing. And God's like, it's evil. It's just as bad as if you're going to go kill somebody. It's evil. Stay away from it. Stay away from it. Instead, and there's, there's a biblical principle here, it's, it's never remove, it's always replace. See, if you remove something from yourself, the scriptures say that that demon leaves and he goes and he gets seven buddies and he comes back and he gets worse. Yeah. So you've got to fill the void. If there's a vacuum that's created. When you got rid of the, if you're a, if, and, and I've talked to Dan about this and he's been very open about his, his experiences in the past of, of, of alcoholism and all that stuff. And, and he's told me, like, if when people stop drinking, like, that's awesome, right? But if you don't replace it with something, if you're not in your meetings, you know, CR or Alcoholics Anonymous or what, something, you, there's a bad, like, if I'm getting hammered every single night and all of a sudden I'm not, 
What am I going to do? I usually get hammered. It's six o'clock. What do I do now? Like you have to, you got to put something in there. Maybe it's crochet, right? Yeah. Crochet. Do something, but 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 don't just leave it empty because if it's empty, you get bored and eventually Jack calls you and he says, "Let's have a drink." So you gotta you gotta replace it. So that's what he says here. He says, "If you get rid of all these things, just like he said earlier, throw off the old nature, put on the new." And he says here, get rid of all the bitterness and the rage and the anger and the harsh words and the slander, all evil. Instead, do something different. Don't be bitter, rageful, anger, harsh. Be kind to each other. Tender hearted. So that's a hard one, especially for guys, right? Be tender hearted. No. It's not my nature to be tender hearted. What does that mean? What does it mean to be tender-hearted? Gentle. Someone, what if someone comes up to you and really gives you the business? You don't, your heart is hard, your heart is hard, and, it, and they punch you, whether it's physically, verbally, emotionally, whatever, and you fight back. But a tender heart, just good. Like, I'm not like that normally. Men, it's not in our nature to do that. But if we're going to get along, and we're going to have a wonderful church life together as a family. What do you got to have? You better have a tender heart. I know I'm going to tick. I've ticked off most of the people in this room already. <laughs> You've got to have a tender heart to be around Mike. <laughs> Forgiving one another. But then Paul just throws this in there. Just in case you don't want to forgive, because I'll never let that go. You don't know what they did to me. I love these people, but I'm not going to forgive that. I hear that all the time. Oh, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. Can you see in your spiritual eyes the size of the mountain of sin, of the, the, the amount of times you have willingly and actively rebelled against the God who loves you? Do you see your pile? And he forgave you of that. What could any of you do to me that could surpass my pile? Is there anything that I could do to you that could surpass or transcend the pile that God forgave for you? Think of the things you've done. And he forgave you willingly. Unconditional love. And he says, you should do that for others. We're looking for that abundant life, right? It's the only way to get it. He says, imitate, verse, uh, chapter 5, imitate God, therefore, in everything you do because you're his dear children. Hey, man, you're God's kid. Tell. Live a life filled with love, following the example of Christ. He loved us and offered himself as a sacrifice for us, a pleasing aroma to God. Let there be no sexual immorality. None. Is there any wiggle room there? This much, right? Let there be no sexual immorality, no impurity or greed. Like, I find that to be weird, that he groups greed in with sexual immorality. Like, that's how important, because we all, I don't, even if you're in an active affair right now, you still know that that's a big bad one. But, but greed? I'm a little greedy. You're a little greedy? Well, a little greedy, right? And we just play it off. But, 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 but what he's saying here is that we need to be, like, really aggressive with our sin. Like, I, I shouldn't take my little bit of greed so lightly. It's a big thing. It's right up there with sexual... It's like, it's as bad... If I'm greedy at, 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 at all, it's just as bad as if I was cheating on my wife. It's bad. Take your sin seriously. Such sins have no place among God's people. Obscene stories... Look, foolish talk and coarse jokes. Again, 
when we were talking about words earlier, we talked about that there's no list of cusses. So we take the other person as more important. If what I say is going to hurt you, I shouldn't, well, I know that it's okay for me to say this word, so deal with it or, or don't listen to me. Right? That's not right. Well, the same thing is here. Coarse jokes, foolish talk. What is that? It's pretty gray, right? It's gray. It doesn't, Jesus doesn't say, hey, this is the kind of joke you shouldn't tell. And he starts writing them down. See, he wouldn't do that because he woke us. But he leaves it up to you. If, it, if, it's, if it's not uplifting and encouraging to your audience, do not say it. Right? Don't say it. No burning bush. These things are not for you. Instead, there it is, replace again. Let there be thankfulness to God. You can be sure that, this, and now this is, this is a stinger, man, and you can read into it what you want. I'm going to leave this up to you. He says, you can, you can be sure that no immoral, impure, or greedy person will inherit the kingdom of Christ or of God. For a greedy person is an idolater worshiping the things of this world. You might as well put up a statue and bow down to it it's just as bad to be greedy. That's what the Word of God says. So if you're not experiencing a, a, a thriving Christianity, maybe you're experiencing a thriving NFL season. Maybe you're experiencing a thriving golf game, a thriving uh, fishing hobby. Maybe you're experiencing such thriving other things and you're worshiping them by giving yourself so loosely and freely and often to those things rather than to the God who forgave you and created you and saved you, maybe that's why you're not enjoying such an abundant life. Just saying. <clears throat> Don't be fooled by those who try to excuse these sins, for the anger of God will fall on all who disobey Him. So there you have it. If you're doing these things, it says the anger of God falls on you. It's like things aren't going to go well. They're not going to go well. Don't participate in the things these people do. For once you were full of darkness, but now you have light from the Lord. So live as people of light. <clears throat> I'm going to leave you with one thing that Jesus said. Luke 6, 46. He says, so why do you keep calling me Lord, Lord, when you don't do what I say? So you've heard the word of the Lord tonight, right? I mean, I didn't, there wasn't a whole lot of creativity there. I just kind of read it, right? And Jesus says, why are you calling me Lord if you don't do what I say? I will show you what it's like when someone comes to me, listens to my teaching, and then follows it. It is like a person building a house who digs deep and lays the foundation on solid rock. When the floodwaters rise and break against that house, it stands firm because it is well built. Who wants that? That's me, right? When? Life happens. I want to enjoy an awesome Christianity that transcends the troubles of this world. That I can still have joy even when it's coming, right? That's what it says. And when you listen to the Word and you do it, you can call him Lord, because he is, and you can enjoy that life. But anyone who hears and doesn't obey is like a person who builds a house without a foundation. When the floods sweep down against that house, it will collapse into a heap of ruins. So you've heard the word of the Lord. I didn't make much up there, did I? Just reading it straight through. There's all these little things that you should and shouldn't do. And so you've heard it. Now, I just want to ask, I'm kind of putting it out there. I don't know if it's going to be a success or a fail. But I asked you earlier if you had some questions about how you should live your life. She said some questions about God, about you. You had questions, right? Raise your hand if you had a question. You raised your hand earlier. You had a question? Raise your hand. Come on. How many people heard an answer? One. 
two, three, four, five. Five people got the answer. Didn't have to wait on the Lord too long, did you? Amen. So he renewed, he just renewed your thoughts and attitudes about something. And so now he's asking you to go throw off the old thing. You heard from the Lord, and now go do what it says. And in the doing will be the enjoying of the Christian life he came to deliver to you. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for tonight. I thank you for your precious word. I thank you, Lord, that it is true and that it is good and it is a light to our path and a lamp to our feet. Lord, I thank you for renewing our spirit. I thank you, Lord, for being here with us tonight. Lord, I thank you for, um, for speaking to those people that raised their hand and admitted that you spoke to them tonight. Thank you for being a living God. And thank you for giving us a living word that is always timely, always true. We can always count on it. Lord, I thank you again for the amazing miracle that is this place. How you have come and, and, and just one thing after another. That we didn't have to raise one dollar to build this place out. It can only be done by God and God alone. You are amazing. Lord, I thank you for that. I thank you, Lord, for this place. And I thank you, Lord, for these people. I thank you, Lord, that, that you have entrusted to us this place. And Lord, I pray that you would help us to be a good steward of this place and all that you have done. Help us to never forget what you have done to make this a reality. Help us to, to, to talk to other people and tell others about all that you have done here so that you would receive glory. Lord, it is our desire to see many, many people, hundreds if not thousands of people, over the years, come here and meet you for the first time, fall in love with you, hear your word, and live it out to the glory of God. So let that come to pass here. Lord, I, I ask that you would help us to invest into this too. Lord, we just thank you so much for what you're doing and, and what you want to do here, Lord. Help us to have dreams and visions of what could be here. And help, us, help the people here, Lord, to dream big dreams. To, to see great things happen here, Lord, with you. Lord, we just want to see your kingdom come here on earth as it is in heaven. So, Lord Jesus, come. We love you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. You all have a good one. If you want to hang out, please do so. I love you all. <laughs>